I do see some crossover in the like, red pillar trad con space where they're saying some of the same things, but then obviously really key differences. What are those sort of unique what insights the... that you think are true that people need to hear? Yeah, sure. Boy, where do we begin here? Going back to the tweet and what I understood your position to be, which is that if you are a man of means or a woman of means mm -hmm. and you are entering a union, you should ensure that you can protect those means in case something goes wrong in the union. And I think that general approach to marriage is not no, a good I, one. Okay, so... And not one we should be recommending okay, at large. That's, th that's my position. Yeah, my point is simply whether or not someone has a prenuptial agreement, they have a prenuptial agreement. It's either you have the default from the state or let us set the terms. Hey guys, welcome back to the Lila Rose podcast. So I just got finished having a conversation, a very long and great conversation with my dear friend Zuby, and he's in town and we were filming for his podcast. We are getting into red pill versus trad con stuff, the division between men and women today and how to heal it. And then we started talking about prenups, <laughs> prenuptial <laughs> agreements. And so we're going to actually pick up kind of where we left off and just go for this episode Thanks for joining, and Zuby. Thanks for being back in California. Happy it's to be to here. Great to have you Always here, Grace. The, Grace the state. A big thank you to our podcast sponsor, Seven Weeks Coffee. Seven Weeks Coffee is small batch, ethically sourced, and gourmet coffee that is delicious. I love the Ethiopian medium roast. They have all kinds of delicious roasts and blends on the site. And what I love about sevenweekscoffee.com is that when you order that bag of delicious coffee, you are supporting the pro-life movement. In fact, 10% of everything that you spend at sevenweekscoffee.com goes directly to fund the Pregnancy Resource Center movement. So it helps moms and babies in need and directly gets donated from Seven Weeks Coffee to the Pregnancy Resource Center movement. So check out sevenweekscoffee.com today. Order a delicious batch of coffee. You can actually become a monthly subscriber, which is a great way to save money and get delicious coffee to your door every single month. And that's sevenweekscoffee.com. Use the code Lila at checkout for 10% off your order. That's Lila at checkout for 10% off your order. I know you've been all over the world since we last talked. Uh, you were on the show, I think, seven or eight months ago. And you continue, I think, to bring light where you go. Thank you. I like how you best. bring, you, you try to bring harmony to some of the crazy conversations and some some light into, into where you go. So anyways, we got into a little bit of a Twitter uh, discussion a couple months back now. It's been mm. a few months about prenups. It was in the context of kind of red pill trad con meta debates happening. <laughs> um, okay, let's start with this because people who listen to the podcast already have heard about red pill stuff to some degree, trad con. Let's just start with defining our terms a little bit. Yeah, sure. Because I think there's a lot of um, confusion, I think, about what these terms even mean now. Mm -hmm. So maybe maybe we can start there. Okay, with, with just terms. Okay, and so, welcome to the show. Thanks for being here. <laughs> happy to be here. Uh, so tradcon, I mean, that is just stands for a traditional conservative. So, so I guess, am I a tradcon? <laughs> yeah, pretty you're much. Catholic. I mean, yeah. you can't really get more tradcon than okay. Than, uh, but tradcons Catholic. can look different. Yeah, of course. I mean, yeah. you could have a Muslim tradcon. You mm -hmm. could have Jewish tradcon. I guess you could. You have non-religious tradcon. I guess you could, but. It would be so rare that it might not be worth discussion. So someone just traditional, traditionally conservative, um, usually a religious background and strong faith, which one mm -hmm. adheres to. That could be Orthodox Jewish, it could be Catholic, could be evangelical, uh, whatever the case may be. That doesn't even matter. Um, but just trying to live by and do everything by the book. But they That's, don't always agree with each other, right? Because no, I've seen that even in the trad con space. No, no, there's different. There's different still different, different opinions. Different opinions. There's still yeah. different personalities. Um, but yeah, politically, certainly socially conservative, mm -hmm. but even usually politically conservative. The fiscal argument, might, I think, is more about social conservatism mm -hmm. than necessary, necessarily what people might call fiscal conservatism. So I'd say socially conservative views. Um, and that includes around things with, you know, relationships, marriage, sex, family, children. So typically like pro-life, mm -hmm. pro-marriage, mm -hmm. against divorce, open to life, like having a you know, big family, some traditional gender roles in terms of like women should really be there for their kids and, mm -hmm. and men too. But men are typically like the provider, the leader of the family um, economically, typically. Again, yes. there's obviously women assisting and things like that. I'm just trying to kind of lay the, the ground yeah, for, say, for how it typically looks for Yeah, people. I mean, you, you definitely, if you're a traditional conservative, then you certainly uh, know that there are only two sexes and that they differ, <laughs> but also that there are gender roles as well. Mm -hmm. um, 
if someone totally rejects the idea of gender roles, they're probably not going to fall into the tradcon bucket because um, that's more liberal or progressive. But thinking. I think in the space of tradcon, there's extremes too, or people that are in different parts of the spectrum. Because sure. I know some people who call themselves tradcons who say women shouldn't vote, mm -hmm. and you know women should never work. It's wrong, you know, wrong for women to work and things like that. Yeah. And I think if your work is getting in the way of your mothering and you you don't have to be doing that work, then that's a problem. You know, mm -hmm. obviously in today's economy, you often need. Um, additional income. It's hard to do it on one salary, et cetera. But so, yeah, there's a lot of obviously those variations, but there's I think typically speaking, <laughs> like you're saying, mar pro marriage, pro life. Yeah. Like awesome. gender, you yeah. know, tradcons are on a spectrum. Just, <laughs> just kidding. Just kidding. Yeah. There's, there's, there's a spectrum of beliefs in everything, just like there is in liberalism, conservative in, in Christianity. Gosh. Mm -hmm. I mean, let alone even in specific denominations of it, you've obviously got the main tranches of um, Protestant, Catholic and Orthodox but then within those, you've got factions, within those, you've got denominations, and within those denominations and even congregations, every single person standing or sitting in that church is going to have slightly different views on things because we're, we're all individuals. The individual is the ultimate minority, but sometimes we need to be able to use shorthand to have conversations. Otherwise, all conversations are impossible. So red pill. Sure. How would you um, define red pill? Yeah. So this is something that is, what, what's interesting about the sort of red pill terminology, obviously it's from the matrix. Uh, so Morpheus offers Neo, he, he can take the blue pill and he stays in this sort of dreamland. He doesn't know how things really work and what the dynamics of the world are, or he can take the red pill and the sort of scales fall from his eyes and he can see all the intricacies and details of how everything really works. So the original idea of the red pill, by the way, the, term, the terminology dates back 20, 20 plus years, um, even when used as applied to gender dynamics. What's weird is in the past sort of two to three years, there's been a sort of resurgence. It, it's been mainstreamed in a certain way, at least online. There have been a sort of handful of influencers, YouTubers, podcasters who have made people aware of the term in a way that they weren't before. Um, in its originality, um, I've got to give credit to a man named Rolo Tomasi here because he's kind of the person who sort of wrote the, the wrote the foundational text. 20 years <laughs> uh, ago? Um, man, when did the first Rational Mail book come out? I mean, yeah, I think he's been blogging for about 20 years. Um, the first book, I think, came out over a decade ago. But the, Sometimes uh, he tweets at me, actually. Oh, yeah? yeah. Okay. Yeah, I, I mean, and, I, and I was... Um, the Fresh and Fit podcast recently came out, Myron from it, saying he wants to host a conversation. Mm. I think you were, I, I know there's I'm happy to moderate it. Tweets around. But I told Myron I'm down, I'm open okay. to doing that and I would be open to talking to Rolla. Yeah, that, that's cool so. because I, I'm in such a weird space because It'd I'm- It'd be great to have you there to I'm moderate. Connected, That'd I'm be connected cool. to like everybody. <laughs> yeah. So it's kind of strange when I see some of these battles and things going on online or all the back and forth because I'm like, I know every single person <laughs> here. I've recorded with all these people. I've met all these people in person. So there's this disconnect that typically exists between these two worlds. Mm. Um, and I'm Meaning kind like of, there's, there's assumptions about agreements and disagreements that are not actually in reality. Like well, we actually agree on these things or disagree on these things. What or? I mean is even, even in social circles, I mean, you're not going to find a lot of people who know and have recorded with Matt Walsh, Ben Shapiro, Candace Owens, Mike, all the Daily Wire people mm -hmm. and yourself and been on Christian podcasts and so on. But I've also been on, I see. Yeah, I've been yeah. on Fresh and Fit six <laughs> times. Mm -hmm. I've, I've met Rolo Tomasi. Like I've been on a show with him. He's been on my podcast. I've, I, I just talk to everybody. Mm -hmm. I talk to everyone. I'm kind of cool with everyone. And I try to see things from the different angles. And I also don't get involved in most of the mm -hmm. spats, the Twitter back and forth, because I'd rather just talk to people in real life and try to think of what's useful. But um, in, in, in proper terms, I guess red pill is not supposed to be an ideology, mm -hmm. but a praxeology, just a way of understanding the world and the, the nature of men, the nature of women, how those gender dynamics interact. It's not supposed to be something that gives prescriptions or advice or says what is right and wrong. It's just like, this is how men are. This is how women are. These are some things you can expect. This is how they sort of evolutionary biology informed. So it's this like a how study, we you would say it's like in a way, like the, a sociological the, study, a study of, gender. of human nature mm. and as and, it pertains to gender dynamics mm -hmm, in particular. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Cause I see a lot of, um, I see a lot of advice being given out by mm -hmm. people in the red pill space and obviously all over the internet, everyone's giving advice. I, I give advice. We all give advice. I think it's kind of hard not um, to. But like, you know, how you should date. Yes. If you should marry. I, you know, there's that viral treat, 
from Rolo saying, <laughs> you know, get a vasectomy, yeah, that was <laughs> don't get married. And then he was like, I'm trolling. You know, yeah, I think he yeah. was like, so I, I see all of that. And, you know, obviously. I think it's a shame that that's like his, probably one of his best known pieces of content on the internet, <laughs> given that it was like one of the goofiest and he's actually written a lot of very valuable and interesting stuff. Mm. Yeah. Well, uh, well, we could even just go there. I mean, I want to talk about the prenup stuff because you and I, you know, I know we're tweeting back and forth about it publicly <laughs> and I do want to just have that conversation. Yeah, sure. No problem. Too. Um, I am interested. I, I'm very interested in hearing you un- kind of unpack what are the things that you think are the most uniquely, the, you know, the unique offerings that someone like a Rolo has that are true. Okay. Um, because, and I say unique because you know, there you can, I do see some crossover in the red pill or trad con space where they're saying some of the same things, you know, mm-hmm. there's some, some similarities, yeah. but then obviously really key differences. So I, I, let's, let's go to that. Cause Start I am that, curious, yeah. like what are those sort of unique what insights the, that you think are true that are that people need to hear? Yeah, sure. So boy, where do we begin here? I guess the first thing is that radical notion that men and women are different. Because I think like every trad con would say that my <laughs> yes. Catholic faith teaches me that, exactly. you know, na- human it, nature, bio- no, biology class prior teaches to, you that. Prior to 2012, so, it would not need to be said, but we yeah. now live in a time where, you know, that, that that does not just mean that we look different or have slightly different body structures and, mm-hmm. you know, reproductive parts and so on, but our interests, our proclivities, and specifically our dating and mating strategies um, from an animalistic evolutionary bio, biology perspective are different. Mm-hmm. Um, as it pertains to women, I know in say Rolo's writing, there's a lot, a lot of, lot of conversation about hypergamy, which is something that uh, simply saying that women tend to date and mate across and up in terms of socioeconomic or status hierarchies. Uh, Jordan Peterson has talked about this many, many times. If you look in any culture, any time, any nation, uh, women typically... It, it's the whole uh, wanting a man who's taller and who earns more money, mm-hmm. if you want to boil it down to a, a sort of simple modern ways to to measure those things. Whereas men are not hypergamous. We don't, most men, in fact, the more, in fact, the more traditional a man is probably the less he cares about how much his uh, well, you wife could, if, or from a wife or I guess you could say the so hypergamy, on. if you use that term, it just mm-hmm. looks different. Like men, maybe that kind of high status man and using those kind of red pill terms is yeah. looking for like a woman with a particular aesthetic who physically lives up to a certain standard he has, or, mm-hmm. you know, she has a certain kind of level of self care that he's seeking and yeah, how think, she presents herself, whatever. You yeah, know. I think both, both men and women, you know, want the sort of best mate that they can get. But it's like, um, how do you define the best mate? And I think that's sure. where it all, all and, the differences and, and, shake and, out. And, like, but I guess the point is that the way mm-hmm. men and women define that is different. Of course, there's mm-hmm. overlap. Yeah. Um, but the oh, things yeah, that women are that, generally yeah. attracted to and men are not necessarily the same things that men are generally but I'm, attracted to. I guess women. what I'm curious about is like, yeah. is, and then we'll move on from sure. Rolo to the um, prenup conversation and try to see what we can that's make there. Good. But but um, what I'm curious about is like, okay, you mentioned some things, but you're like, Jordan Peterson says that. And I'm like, Trad Khan says oh, some okay. of that. Like, so what, what, are what the, would be unique? Like, what would be something that you think- What's unique cause I, from the Because the unique stuff, I, you, yeah, just to mm. be candid, like the unique stuff I how, see from um, the oh, Red how, Pill um, world. How a woman's dating and mating strategy may change mm-hmm. as over the course of her, depending on how old she is. Like the, the whole phase her, theory over the, her age, um, as I've seen if, it, if you want to put it that bluntly, I mean, that's what I see. Um, call it. <laughs> and the, you know, dual, so. dual mating strategies. Mm-hmm. So in different phases, different times and places, there being multiple, there's more than one mating strategy that either a man or a woman mm-hmm. can adopt. Um, we're both fans of monogamy, but obviously, you know, polygyny, polygamy is a, is an, as a mating strategy we talked before mm-hmm. of if you're a man who has a lot of status and a lot mm-hmm. of resources at any time in human history, pretty much mm-hmm. and probably at an all time low right now, but it would have been normal. Oh, you can afford three wives, then have three wives. You can afford mm-hmm. 10 wives, then have 10 wives. Um, so was, you're saying that's kind of the more unique aspect of red pill that was different from your trad Connor or Jordan Peterson, where they're saying women typically go through, I mean, the argument I've seen, if, mm-hmm. correct me if I'm wrong, let no me hear, if, I, if I hear this correctly, this is good prep. If we do have a conversation, yeah, it's, all good. Um, it's like that women go through this phase where they're really promiscuous and then they want to settle down or, you know, women, uh, you know, high status men are more naturally bent and should mm-hmm. want polygamy. They mm-hmm. would, they or polygyny. I should say they would yes. want to have I think multiple... The, 
wives and that's not necessarily and my my impression of it is a lot of the red pillars say that's not a bad thing that men mm-hmm. should have high status men yes. should have access to multiple have multiple families yeah, it's not well, a big deal I, I think this is when people start putting their sort of own personal opinion and advice mm-hmm. bringing into it hmm. um certainly in the original form of a lot of red pill thought it was just like this is what it is this is this is what the proclivities are this is what our natural tendencies are And then, of course, you have society, you have religion, you have culture, you have laws, you have all these things on top of it to take people out of their just raw base nature and mating strategies and implement some type of thing that actually works in society, like marriage. And And acknowledge that they have free will and a soul. You know, we're not just animals with base instincts. So I guess you could say a lot of the red pill thought is, okay, if we were just, if you removed all of the restrictions and structures of society, um, what would males and females do, right? Around the animal kingdom, how do the males typically behave? How do the females typically behave? How are their mating patterns different in order to ensure the survival of their species? So I guess in the most raw, mm-hmm. raw sense, you could say the red pill is just sort of taking away from aspects of morality and ethics and social conditioning and whatever, what is the sort of raw state mm-hmm. of man? What's the raw state of women? Um, you're always going to be generalizing as it um, as it pertains to mating and intersexual dynamics. I guess that's really what it is. I think in the, in the last couple of years, it's become quite tainted by people's personal opinions mm-hmm. and advice of, oh, well, I think you should do this or I think you should do that or whatever. And the justification might be like, okay, well, this is our natural state. You know, someone might say, oh, well, marriage and monogamous are not natural per se. Mm-hmm. That's not sort of the natural state, the natural state of a man, especially if he's able to and has status and whatever, and he's tall and he's good looking and he has money, <laughs> then his natural proclivity is to mate with all the attractive uh, reproductive age women that that he can. Mm-hmm. And then some people will take that a step further and say, okay, and that, therefore he should. Mm-hmm. Um, where I think, you know, we'd both be like, uh, no, like that's not, that's not right. <laughs> that's right. not right. That's not moral. <laughs> that's not appropriate. That's not good for society. That's not good for individuals. It's not good for children. Um, but yeah, this is when people start overlaying, I think, totally. their, their personal stuff on it. Well, it's interesting because it all comes back to the question of like, what is human nature? Mm. Like, what does it mean to be human? And also, what does it mean to be a man and a woman? And if, depending on your answer, you can come to very different outcomes and how we should behave or what is acceptable, what are acceptable ways for us to behave. And so I think if, if it is, if your view of like a man's nature is that he is, you know, animal, and mm-hmm. which he is animal. We are humans, are animals. You know, we are creatures, and therefore he should. You know, he has this urge to, as you say, maybe procreate with all these, you know, reproductive age women, whatever, right? But then you remember, like, man is animal, but man is also soul. He's yes. also rational, and he's also given this uh, the gift of the intellect. And we know, based on you know what our intellect can teach us, that we're not just to you know, not just that we aren't just to behave like animals, but it's also not good for us to just behave like animals. Like, you know, it actually brings a lifetime of sorrow to Mm -hmm. have, you know, a thousand sexual partners and, you know, a hundred children out of wedlock. And like, you know, so, so it's amazing though, to see that, you know, even if we behaved, if we behaved purely like the animals Mm -hmm. and followed our base instincts, it would not bring some sort of freedom or happiness. It would actually bring total we've run the experiment. civilizational demise. We, we've, you know? <laughs> we've quite literally run the experiment. It wasn't that I, I was not alive in the 1960s, but yeah. it seems like across the modern Western Anglosphere, the 1960s was this whole rise of nice. the you know free love or whatever someone wants to call it, that sort of hippie movement, massive liberalization of all of these, uh, these social standards mm-hmm. and religious codes and so on. And 60 plus years later, I think we are very much seeing the consequences Mm -hmm. of it all. That's what we're living through. That's what we are trying to decipher and pull apart right now. It's like, oh, that experiment, uh, that experiment ran and it didn't seem to really make uh, men and women happier in general. It seems to be Mm -hmm. causing quite a lot of mental health problems, let alone all the children growing up in places, you know, households with absent fathers, rise of single motherhood, rise of um, abortion, actual rise of unwanted pregnancies, which ironically came out of, after the pill, there were more unwanted pregnancies than prior to it, which people would not have expected. So um, yeah, we're trying to untangle the mess now. Yeah. So I think the biggest sort of um, concern about red pill is where you take the raw human nature analysis Mm. of like the man versus the woman, and you can kind of draw different 
theories or conclusions around it, and some may be more or less true or more or less not, but then you start to add on the praxology of therefore it's okay or it's understandable for you to just go do mm. this and we're not gonna, like don't be too, yeah, and then you add on that and that's what I see the most of, okay, okay. honestly, um, and that's where there's the biggest disagreement, right? Yeah. So anyways, it would be very cool, I think, to have that conversation, I'm totally, down. We'll see. We'll see if it materializes. Yeah, I'm due in April. Okay. So I'm like, I, I, I <laughs> sent a message on, on Twitter recently. I was like, Hey, I'm down, but it has to be like very soon because okay. <laughs> I'm going to be out of commission in a few weeks, but, yeah. um, differences between men and women right there. Um, I respect it. Yeah. I respect it massively. Thank you to our podcast sponsor, NimiSkincare.com. I'm very picky about my skincare products. I always change products. I never liked the products I have. And when I discovered NimiSkincare.com a few months ago, I fell in love. Their products are simple and clean and easy to use. And they're really designed for any kind of skin. So you can have these great products and you can mix and match them based on your skin type. I love their deep hydration cream. I use their vitamin C scrub and I also love Love their brightening sunscreen that I put on every single morning. What I love about NimiSkincare.com is not just that it's a great product and one that I think you'll love, but it also is a pro-life company. So this is a company that shares your values. It's pro-life and pro-family. So when you're ordering from Nimi Skincare, you know you're not supporting causes that you oppose, but actually causes that you love. So go to NimiSkincare.com today. That's N-I-M-I Skincare.com. And you can use the code Lila at checkout for 15% off your first order. That's the code Lila at checkout for 15% off your order at nemiskincare.com. We also were talking on Twitter a little bit about prenuptials because mm. you had a tweet that came out. I, I, don't, I can't even remember how the conversation well, started. Well, I think now. it was because you tweeted something. I, I'm not going to pull it up. It'll take too okay. long. But it basically, correct me if I'm wrong. As I remember, it was saying, you know, you're basically saying it would be foolish for a man who was of great means, like a millionaire, mm. I think was the term you used. Okay to not have a prenup. Yes. And, you know, it's a very definitive statement. Basically, if you're a wealthy man, you need a prenup and mm. it's foolish not to. And I responded by saying, no, <laughs> <Basically>, <laughs> <laughs> I don't agree. And, um, and there was our disagreement, yeah. but basically, you know. I, that conversation I, went like four days. I, I was I, like, know, we, were, we did go back and forth a little bit. <laughs> yeah, and, yeah. and again, my position isn't that every prenup is always wrong. Mm -hmm. It's more that having a principle that because I am wealthy and I have these, you know, material assets, Therefore, if I marry, I must protect those material assets from a woman who might go astray in the future in mm -hmm. our marriage. I think that's the wrong view to enter a marriage with. And that was what I was attempting to communicate online in Twitter, <laughs> Twitter tweets, it's, it's, it's you know, or to. X. It's not even Twitter, and it's then X, it ended right? ended up like a conversation um, with me versus like trying to battle like a thousand people. <laughs> <all> <laughs> well, yeah, then everyone, wait, everyone's <laughs> piling on, you know, which is fun. Like that's X, yeah. like that is fun. Like, thank you, Elon Musk for X. But yes. anyways, I'd love to hear your, yeah. yeah, let's just talk about it for a little bit. Yeah, I'd love no to hear your, um, your take on that. Yeah. Absolutely. Absolutely. So, man, there's so many different angles I can approach this mm -hmm. from. So I think the first thing that's probably worth saying is um, I would have had the same reaction, perhaps even uh, as recently as one year ago. Um, I used to, if, you know, I think the term prenup itself is uh, <laughs> probably popularized by Kanye West Gold Digger song um, <laughs> and like sort of mainstream media. But um, I also used to view for the vast majority of my life, the idea of a prenup meaning that, oh, there's a, there's a lack of trust or someone's entering with, um, you know, like not wanting to be all in that type of thing. That was the sort of meme in my head that mm -hmm. I guess I had just um, absorbed a bit like prior to becoming explicitly pro-life, I had just kind of adopted the societal meme of like, oh, like being... I never liked the idea of abortion. I never really thought about it all. But when I actually did like research and listen to people and actually did some reading on the topic, I was like, oh, I have changed my mind on this. Mm -hmm. um, so that is, this is probably the issue I've most recently, uh, issue of significance I've most recently changed my mind on. Done so what, pretty what much changed your mind? Yeah, Information, just learning more, learning more about what it is, what it isn't, the different reasons why um, people any, why, why a couple mm -hmm. may, may have one and get one. Um, so first of all, I think that when it comes to what marriage is supposed to be as by God's design <laughs> and intention, I think we are very much on the same page mm -hmm. from what I know about your beliefs. I also think that sadly <laughs> in the modern world, we are in the minority um, of truly having that belief of a lifelong covenant binding two people and their families in front of God that's not to be ripped apart for random frivolous reasons. Um, 
that's just that sadly that's that's where we are. This is the reality of of where we are right now. So I think that my point being made in that um original oh and and let me let me add one more thing cuz I think one of the most important points is that every if you're going to get married in the legal system, state government approval so on, all of this stuff goes pretty much out the window if you're just mm-hmm. talking about two people coming together, having a church wedding or synagogue wedding, whatever, mm-hmm. and not signing all the documents <clears throat> and all the legality of it. This is talking about the legality, is that you're already entering into a legal contract and you're under a set of laws in a jurisdiction. And that jurisdiction essentially has a default prenuptial agreement. Mm-hmm. Most people actually, when they get married, they don't actually know what they're signing up for. They don't, it's not like a, a contract and they, they read through all the documentation of what it means for their finances, for their property. And even common law marriages, has mm-hmm. a, you, you could argue, has the sort of, there are rules that engage even that. Like yes. If you've lived together for long and people enough, don't things know. like that. Yes. And, and, and people don't generally know. So I would say that if someone is choosing to get married legally, you already are you're already signing a contract. People say, oh, religious people like to say, it's not a covenant, it's a contract. I'm like, it, it, it's both. It's, it it's both, a contract. Yeah. If, if you are legally getting married, you are mm-hmm. signing, you're literally signing a contract. And it's not only one of the most um, important decisions you make in your life, it's also the most important financial decision you make in your life. And there is no other contract where people would not that's of significance where people wouldn't read through the terms and actually even if they can negotiate it to be what what they would like it to be. So uh, my point is simply whether or not someone has a prenuptial agreement, they have a prenuptial agreement. It's either you have the default from the state or as a couple, man, woman, who are like, hey, we want to do this thing. We want to be together, whatever. It, all it's saying is y- let us set the terms. So, I mean, I, I hear what you're saying, but okay. I think that the big question is this, which is that, of course, like there are rules that govern, um, you can say rules that govern marriage to mm-hmm. the extent of, uh, you know, obviously there's tax law, you know? Sure. Uh, you know, if you're filing as married versus not, but, you know, you can file as married versus not when you're married. Like sure. those are decisions you can make. Um, but if you were to separate, you know, there's how the assets might be divided. Mm-hmm. And I think that's where the the rub is, is, is my understanding with your mm-hmm. position. And so I guess the b- first big question I have is what do you see in the current stat, you know, the current law system? Um, because it sounds like, again, your tweet is about protecting money from someone who might go astray in the future. It's in a lot marriage. more than that, by the way. Okay. Well, cause you, you, so, so you have the I, term should I, million. Should I go through, yeah, should I go through what that. I think are the, what are the potential benefits? Of well, let's, let's start with the existing agreement? law. Cause you're, you're saying the okay. existing law is basically a prenup that governs if the marriage dissolves or yeah. divorces. So what would you say are the issues, maybe the top three or the top two with the existing law that are okay. unfair in how they govern, um, you know, how kind of a divorce settlement court might treat, you know, the assets of the divorcing parties or something. Okay. So there are, it depends on jurisdiction. There are places where, there are places where premarital, premarital assets Mm -hmm. are completely off the table and there are places where they're not. So again, this is coming back to the, there's already a default prenuptial agreement. So someone might be living in a place where, like There's, the nation, like America versus yeah, UK and, and versus a nation Dubai in a state or, where. So let's say someone's getting married and they're forty years old. Mm-hmm. They've been working for the past twenty two years. Um, they've accumulated assets. They own properties. They have a, they own a company or they've got a stake in a company. Whatever it is, they have stocks. They've got mm-hmm. whatever it is, um, all accumulated before they even perhaps met, let alone married. Um, the person so, they're marrying. This this is not even about men, women. This is just people, right? You've like got, an inher- You have an inheritance, as an yeah, example. Yeah, so you've got and, wh- wh- whatever, yeah. whatever the case may be. Um, and so I think it is obvious that any premarital assets in the event, in the you know godforsaken event of of a divorce, that should not even that that should be off the table. It shouldn't be. Oh, like I bought a property when I was twenty five years old before like 18 years before I met this person and somehow they're entitled to like, that's bonkers. That should not well, even I'd, be a thing. I'd be curious to unpack that a little okay, bit sure. because I think, 
you know, for example, let's say, let's just take a scenario and let's, let's try to talk about maybe America and UK just yeah, to no kind problem. of, you, no you're problem. right. Endless, there's mm-hmm. endless countries with endless laws, but okay. for the sake of kind of this conversation of, you know, if you're a millionaire, you need a prenup kind mm-hmm. of uh, argument that I, that I was Elon trying to kind of engage. Elon should not get married with that one. Um, well, <laughs> I, you know, should Elon get married? I don't know. Like, oh. That's another question. Um, but uh, anyways, um, I wish he'd, I, I mean, I, I, by the way, Elon Musk, who I, I think he's done some really interesting and amazing things, but like he has all these children and mm-hmm. he, he had, I think four or five kids with his first wife, Yes, you know? So it's just a, not to pass judgment because yeah. I don't know his personal circumstances, but it's like, imagine if you had Elon stay with his first wife and stay with his, oh, as a father. I don't of, know, you know who, I don't know who, uh, it would, who, it, we don't, it, as, as it, they say, it, you who know, knows, who knows? Women, we, women, we, women follow the majority of divorces. Yeah. yeah we 80%. don't, we don't know the details. Thank you to our sponsor, everylife.com. Everylife.com is America's baby products company. They have diapers and wipes for your little one. These are great quality products that are great for your little one's skin that are ethically sourced. And what I love about everylife.com is unlike Pampers and Huggies, which are actually companies that support abortion, believe it or not, everylife.com is a pro-life company that donates money back to the pro-life movement. So when you get these great products for your baby, you're also supporting the pro-life movement and you're not supporting abortion. So check out everylife.com today. You're gonna love the brand. You're gonna love the products. They're great. And you can use the code Lila at checkout for 10% off your order. That's everylife.com. And you can use the code Lila at checkout for 10% off your order. But okay. anyways, back to kind of like... Um, you know, where we're at today. Let's just say someone gets married. Yes. They, like you said, they bought a house or they bought some property. That's like an, a, an investment property. Let's uh-huh. say they were 21 and they're, you know, now they're 28. I don't know. It yes. has accrued in value. They get married to a woman. She doesn't really have many assets, but they get married mm-hmm. and then they have like four kids together. Right. Mm-hmm. And then God forbid there's a divorce of some kind that starts to happen, okay. like initiated by one or the other. Okay. Right. Um, she has raised those kids in the last five to 10 years. Like yes. she's not been making money or, you know, investing in new rental properties or anything. She's, mm-hmm. her primary work has been the kit, the children. Yes. Maybe she's had some side hustles. Um, he's been continuing to grow his income and the rental property is one of his assets. Mm-hmm. And now they're separating and she is gonna need to be able to provide for those children when she has her shared custody of them mm-hmm. or whatever. She's been out of the job market now for years, whatever. Anyways, my understanding, again, I'm not a, I'm not a family law attorney, so it would be interesting to have one on the show. Maybe yes. I should. That's yeah, yeah, actually I think the next you, I think step. You should, yeah. um, but you know, she is entitled to some of his assets um, because even though she wasn't working and they didn't belong to belong to them before they Why? got married because she has been providing something to the family unit that has an economic value that you can't right off as nothing. But and why, that's, but why should she, why would she be entitled to the premarital assets? Well, I, I, that would be a question of like how much of it she's entitled to versus not. I think okay, um, in l- part because but, but they're perhaps an even more in, in part, because I would say they're growing in value. I would imagine during their marriage, but it's his, um, but when he married her and she chose to invest so much of her time and heart in raising those children, like mm-hmm. what is his became hers too, you know? So I think that's, I, yeah, I, I think that, that's in the it's, argument, that, right? that in itself is, uh, is the huge problem. And as long as the law remains that way, all that's going to happen is more men who, or, or women at this stage, because women are starting to uh, have a lot of stuff. I think young women are actually more likely to have property than men are now. Then, um, all that's going to happen is fewer and fewer people will get married because that's such a poor incentive. Well, I think it, I think the biggest question is okay. not even if they should divvy up that premarital asset mm. they had before marriage, two thirds, half and half at all. If yeah. the biggest question is um, if if and when you get married, mm-hmm. you know, are you going into the marriage with concern about your assets mm-hmm. and protecting them from the spouse that might sh- go the wrong well, way? Look, uh, or are you going into the marriage in terms of this is my one flesh I'm going to be committed to for life and I'm going to really you. select the best okay, spouse Okay, let, me, let I can. me ask you a question. Do you think that people should get married with the state involvement and sign the papers and sign the legal contracts? I think it's good to, uh, provided you don't have some very defunct state. Because okay. you, if you're like, if I'm in like the Soviet Union and I'm getting secretly married underground by the Catholic Church, which is illegal, yeah, I'm not going to give this, I don't, probably won't want the state involved in my marriage. I okay. think, you know, it's, it depends on the country, but why, generally speaking, yes. Why, why do you think having having state involved is important or good? Because I think the purpose of the state besides rule of law and Mm -hmm. defending and protecting basic human rights is to create an environment for flourishing families. So there should be actually 
state incentives to get married. But we and, have state disincentives. To well, get married. it depends who you're asking. Because if you're talking to the woman who is giving up, you know, so much of her physical body and her time and her life. What to, if the woman has more assets than the man, and she won't, and she's the one who's well, I, got? I think there's going to be endless scenarios that are unique about assets. About okay. like this person had a little more money, this person had a little more money. But that's why I think the general principle about marriage should be all in. We're going to combine our assets this is as a general principle, mm -hmm. right? Again, I'm not saying there aren't some cases where it could be as an exception, not a rule, okay. perhaps prudent, especially if the country you live in has some crazy laws mm -hmm. to have some sort of premarital agreement. But I think generally speaking, mm -hmm. Whether you're wealthy or poor, entering a marriage should be an exercise of an all. But in. we have we live again. We live in a time that's where that's the nature of we marriage. Live, it's we the live, nature of marriage. It's supposed to be, but it's not. But it's we not. Live, we, and we so, live, we, yeah. in the U.S., the divorce rate. Let Let's take the average of the things people say. It's it's mm -hmm. hovering around forty percent. It's hovering around forty percent. So at large, if, but when you when you break that statistic yeah. down and you look at different groups, for sure. divorce but, is much higher raw, around. Like if you're a group that selects to marry in a certain way, has certain values, has certain behaviors can, and practices, you can, you can bring it down. your outcomes are much better, meaning mm -hmm. there's much lower rates of divorce. So if you just take a general population at large and you say, well, they're all divorcing, so they all should have prenups, I think that's not making for a good plan for civil, you know that society well, I, to advance. Well, I don't understand the op the opposition to. Mm -hmm. So my my the reason I'm in favor of prenups is because number one, I a huge mm -hmm. question with all of these things I'd ask is well, why leave that up to the state? Why leave, leave, why, why leave, leave that up to the states and the courts? So if the people getting married, if they do want to go more all in and they want to consider premarital last and jo join everything together, my point is you, the couple, rather than lawyers and this web of whoever it is, you can make all those agree. You, you, you just say what we agree. This is what mm. this is what it is. You can you can your your prenup can be as, as simple or as complicated or whatever it is. Um, so I think a major part of it is to even force these discussions and avoid future arguments. Finances, one finances and assets, those are one of the mm -hmm. biggest things that tear people apart in relationships and marriages and so on. This can even involve people outside of those two individuals, other family members. You, you mentioned inherent inheritances, all this kind of stuff. It, you know, if you if you are if you own a company or you're a member of a company and so on, all of these things get increasingly complicated. So mm -hmm. what you can do is you can just create a prenup in a way that actually incentivizes better behaviors as it currently stands with no fault divorce laws. Mm -hmm. So you're saying, okay, people come together and everything becomes one. Mm -hmm. You can have a situation where, okay, that happens four years later, five years later, someone's like, okay, I'm bored, peace, I'm gone. That's totally legal to do. And then it's like, oh, and I'm taking half your stuff with me. That should not be incentivized. That 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 like the fact that that's even possible is that should not be possible. That that's that's my point. It's like that should not even be possible. So I totally agree with you of how marriage should be approached and what the covenant should mean and so on. I'm just saying we live in a very very deeply fallen world and society where that is not the case. So one of the reasons why I'm in favor of <laughs> normalizing prenuptial agreements is because I think it will actually encourage it will actually encourage more marriage because until some of this legal framework and some of these giant gaping holes are patched up, which are providing perverse incentives for people to break up their marriages and break up their mm -hmm. families because they can be rewarded for it financially, that shouldn't, I'm just saying that, that, that shouldn't, you can, you can close those mm -hmm. gaps. You can close those gaps yourself and you can do that as a couple rather than, you know, long-term, again, hopefully everything works, but it goes through this whole mess and now there's all this animosity and resentment and there's fighting and it's super expensive and it's crazy and it's horrible for everyone. It's just like, why not just say, state up front what it is and, and make sure that both all parties are incentivized mm -hmm. to do this. It also provides peace of mind. Let, let's, let's take the extreme example. Mm -hmm. Let's take an Elon Musk. Um, someone with his level of, well, any, any woman he marries, in his, the back of his mind, in, there's always going to be a concern of, is she with me for me or is it because I'm Elon and I've got, you know, 300, I'm worth $300 billion and I've, I own all these companies, I have all these assets, whatever it is. I think it also just provides the peace of mind for that person because it's like people say, 
okay, you shouldn't have a prenuptial agreement because it means that um, you think divorce is even an option. And it's like, well, it cuts both ways because if divorce is not even an option, what's the opposition to having it? What's the opposition to just agreeing something and saying, okay, look, we are absolutely in this. We are absolutely in this together, whatever. I know that both of our, we're both well mean. Mm-hmm. To, to me, it's additional trust. It's, it's the opposite of mistrust. It's actual additional trust where you can sit there and say, okay, cool. Like we love each other. We're going to do this. This is not about, you know, imagine Elon, you know, it's not about my money, my assets, what you could potentially get from me or whatever. We're just doing this thing. We want to raise this family. We want to stay together. So I think it can be done in a way that it, it incentivizes the good behavior rather than incentivizes mm-hmm. bad behavior. I, it's a real problem um, having these perverse incentives where it's like you can break your vow and be rewarded for it. Yeah, I mean, like I think that. practically speaking, I would be interested if there's data about like people who are getting who are getting prenups, these like very carefully mm. crafted individualized prenups sure. that you're recommending, and are they more likely to have these successful marriages? I mean, I I don't know that there's I data don't, that shows that. I doubt that. that. I don't know that there. It would probably be quite hard to get data on, and it would be hard to do because it's a multivariate. Mm-hmm. So you'd also need to somehow like filter out religiosity and filter but, out like all the that, other variables. I think, you see I think what that's I mean? the problem I have with the prescription you're 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 giving, mm-hmm. you know, and that that tweet. And that was my problem with the tweet. It's it's one thing to have a very ex- <laughs> exceptional case of someone like an Elon Musk who has mm-hmm. multiple businesses. Oh, I don't think and, it needs to be that that exceptional you know, at all. Well, well, or someone okay. who's like a widower with adult children, and you know, he wants. Uh, I mean, you could kind of craft up these very you know mm. unique unique cases. What and about we could, with previous children. We could, that's we a could yeah, we could talk, talk, yeah, if they're children and, you know, the justice that's owed to those children mm. versus, you know, children you may have with your new marriage and like whatever, right? Yeah. Um, but I think that, that, you know, the challenge I have is this prescription of if you are wealthy, you need a prenup. Mm-hmm. And I think because you might have some woman that you marry who's not as wealthy who wants your money mm-hmm. um, in the future. And I or think that's, um, or yeah, women. if you're, wealthy, if you're a wealthy there. woman, I guess yeah. you could say the same. And I think that's where I, I think there it's you're, we're sending the wrong message, and it's the wrong principle to, upon which to enter marriage. I'll now, be, okay. to, now just to be Go clear, ahead. there are existing. I understand in our you know legal system. Mm-hmm different ways to protect assets, different ways that family who pass on wealth protect mm-hmm. assets, you know, that um, are affected or not affected by marriage or divorce. So, you know, again, we don't have that family law attorney here. Sure. Um, Do you so, have a problem with those? Well, uh, not necessarily. Okay. I mean, I would want to look at the individual ones, but I haven't seen something where I'm like, well, that seems unjust. Sure. What does seem unjust is someone who goes into a marriage saying, I've got to protect this money from Why my spouse. Why is that unjust? Because when you go into a marriage, I believe you, you mean need it's immoral. You think it's a, you think it's a moral issue. I I mean I think it's an issue of the nature of what is the nature. What should be the nature of marriage? Mm-hmm. Is it a true marriage where you're going in with full um, commitment? If, if okay, can and I without g- can, sort can of I g- can I give a hypothetical? And it might sound a little crazy. Mm-hmm. Um, if if it were the case that somehow you know by magic, if uh, the marriage was just like, okay, in the event, in the event of a divorce, mm-hmm. um, uh, you know, both people get, or both or one person gets sick and dies. So they have <laughs> divorced already? No, no, no. Or, let, no. Let, let, let's okay. say, let's say that theoretically, um, in the marriage laws, it was that if, if a, if a divorce takes place, then one person, I don't know, gets, one person gets in prison for life. Okay, so you're saying it's like this special penalty that the law has. Yeah, let's let's say let's say let's they, say the consequence of divorce was imprisonment. Okay, for the person who did the divorce. Uh, let's or let's say for let's okay. say for both. Okay. Let's say for both. Let's let's just take an extreme because I'm okay. just trying to understand something. Okay. Um, and let's say you could create an agreement that mm-hmm. says, okay, I think that that's a bit extreme and unfair. Mm-hmm. Um, we can we can undo cr- that. We with can, the prenup. We can, yes, we, we can we <laughs> yeah. can have a, we can make an agreement which undoes yeah. the thing that says in the event of a divorce we, yeah. we both end up in prison for. Would life. I be okay with that? As you're asking. Do, do, yes. Of course, and and, and okay. because what we're because we're, the we're, consequences are well because it would okay. be unjust to have a law that says if you okay so if you think but the but current, let me just, okay, to, just to explain Sorry, just ahead. to explain so the, you know we're using this term prenup and throwing it around. Mm-hmm. A lot of it depends on what is the purpose of the prenup and what does the prenup says. Agreed. Back to your tweet and what I understand your position to be, the purpose of it and the sort of spirit behind it is I have wealth 
it's not fair that this woman I'm going to marry gets a significant portion of my wealth that I accrued before her. Mm-hmm. Therefore, I'm going to protect it from her in case things go south. Okay, this her. is not my this is not my okay. position. So then I misunderstand you. So sure, help me understand your, your position. So then. so I think the primary benefits of a prenuptial agreement, like I said, I think number one is actually to prevent potential arguments, not just within mm-hmm. a couple, but also amongst family members of in laws, all that type of stuff. Um, Also, as I've said, if you have potential inheritances, if you have a business, if you have business partners and so on, there's many places where they're like, okay, you can get married, but there's got to be some type of prenuptial agreement because there's all the, you're plugged into all of these other things. We've already talked about people potentially Mm -hmm. um, already, already having um, children. I think people ensure, people ensure everything else. People ensure health, people ensure their cars, people ensure all these things that are far less important than their marriages. So it's additional peace of mind. As I've said, I think it also- So you're saying it's insurance. So you're saying, I just, I misunderstand you because it's not about protecting your wealth. It's about insurance to protect the wealth. I don't don't like, I don't like the concept of life insurance. It doesn't make Mm -hmm. me feel good. Um, I don't like to think of the idea of, oh my gosh, like if I, if I die or I'm incapacitated, like I'm planning kind of planning for my death. Like but there's I don't, no moral issue with it, right? Like it's no, not like- No, I, I don't have a moral issue yeah. with it. I'm just mm-hmm. saying, because a lot of people with their with their their pushback against prenuptial agreement, it's it's largely an emotional reaction. It's it's, a, it's an emotional like- I don't way. think for me, I think it's- Maybe not, maybe not in your what case. I, what I think in my case mm-hmm. it is, again, like going back to the tweet and what I understood your position to be, okay. which again, I'm trying to, maybe I, sure. maybe I misunderstand it, sure. which is that if you are a man of means or a woman of means, mm-hmm and you are entering a union, you should ensure that you can protect those means in case something goes wrong in the union. And I think that general approach to marriage is not no, a good uh, one. Okay, so and not one we should be recommending okay, at large. That's th- that's my position. Yes. And it's not because I'm, it's not because of an emotional thing. It's mm-hmm. because I think that people should be entering marriage, not only with the all in spirit of yes. full commitment, you know, without the sort of trap door of, I mm-hmm. can get out of this later, but also with an understanding that what you do with a marriage is not just about satisfying each other and having fun together. Agreed. You build a family together Agreed. and a family project, all your resources you should make available to that mm-hmm. family project. Like that is the purpose of your resources should be not your own personal pursuits and pleasures, but the family project and the family project needs both spouses to, to, to lead it. So to sort of like siphon so, off part okay. of your let me, Re, just eventually, like, just to siphon okay. off part of your resources from the other spouse to say, yeah, I'm doing this family project with you, but I'm not going all in with my resources because um, I want to protect them from you in case something goes south. I think that's the wrong posture for the, not just for her mm-hmm. sake of the wife, mm-hmm. but for the kids. And if God forbid there is some sort of separation in the future by choice of one or the other or both, mm-hmm. um, the work that you did together in that family project, I mm-hmm. think needs to be honored. And I think assets, generally speaking, maybe not all, again, this is where even family law recognizes mm-hmm. that not all assets are on the chopping block Depends necessarily. Um, <laughs> well, <laughs> like inheritances and things like yeah. that, you know, again, we'll have the family law yeah, attorney on, but you, you know, again, back to that, the reason we have this, a lot of the 50-50 going on, my understanding mm-hmm. in law is because when you do the family project thing, mm-hmm. you know, typically speaking, um, you, you, you build these rhythms in your household and your parenting where it's not equal economically, Mm -hmm. you know, like someone might be getting the paycheck, but the Mm -hmm. other person's contributing in a way that's not the paycheck. And these things should not be so black and white in terms of, okay, well, I had this money, so I I get to keep it afterwards. So why not decide for yourself? Why leave it up to the state? Well, I think if the state again is unjust in how they're doing things they at are. large, and but that, well, and that's the thing, but that's where I and haven't, I guess, and that's yeah. where we haven't landed the plane. So we're gonna have to do part yeah, two because yeah. I, I know you got to get going in yeah. a minute. Okay. but that's where uh, it's can like. I, can yeah. I can I ask one question? Do you think that with the way that the because because you're 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 even questioning about whether or not you think it's just? Surely, I mean, you you're aware that like what law is so unjust today that you need a prenup as a millionaire alimony? in the United and this is in the United States alimony? or in the UK? Alimony. So, so the fact why, that you why, would, why should a man who so let okay let's let's give a scenario let's so say all alimony laws you would say are unjust all al- alimony I think policies. it should be I think it should be up to the people I don't think that you sh- I don't think that a man who's been divorced by a woman should be paying her t- five grand ten grand a what month if he divorces for, her for the rest of her life because while she's even gone into a relationship with another man just to pay for her existence like there's nothing just about that. Um, what if he has divorced her? I think that you make your own. Yeah, I think the couple should decide what is fair and just between my them, understanding rather than between, it up to the state. My understanding behind alimony, and again, I'm learning here, so mm-hmm. 
you know, it's, it's a I process. Like, it's an old concept. Yeah, but it's an old concept. From when women because, didn't work. But it's also not just when women didn't work. It's also the idea that um, when you create that family project together or that, again, the, the integ- you know, the sort of um, reality of a household together, yeah. that typically speaking, there's economic value that the woman is bringing, whether through child rearing, bearing, okay. or just so, household management that you can't necessarily put so a dollar amount on. So if the family is on. split up, why should payments continue. You're not even a family anymore. Because uh, theoretically, I guess, in the case of a lot of the alimony Because in this case, you're saying, okay, is, premarital assets are on the table, m- assets because, I mean, gathered within, them, way, within me, it get, are on the table, well, and then real. future like, income is like on the table. Like if we're really going to get in the weeds on it, like think about it this way. <laughs> if you took yourself out of the workforce, yes. you stopped your podcast, you yeah. stopped your consulting, you stopped mm-hmm. your traveling, you stopped everything, stopped your social media, mm-hmm. or you put on super slow burn, right? Mm-hmm. And you're just literally burying babies for five years, or you're like, you know, putting together a new house and managing household systems. Systems and you're really devoting yourself to that, right? Mm-hmm. And your income, of course, is going to take a nosedive, let's say. Sure. And, um, you know, then five years later, you marry someone, they're, they're bringing in a lot of the income. Then five years later, it's, it, it's on the rocks. Let's just say for whatever reason, it's ended. Maybe you didn't even choose it. Maybe you did, mm-hmm. whatever. Um, and it's over. <clears throat> I think the alimony argument is you just invested yourself, your talents, your heart into this relationship and into this family's structure, right? And the other person's just, they're, they're just, they're still getting that paycheck. You know, Mm -hmm. their, their career has actually gone up, you know, Mm -hmm. they're doing really well. And so in the family court system, my understanding is, okay, well, that person should get something of that because they help make that happen. For all the future after the relationship, that's insane. To some, to some degree, a certain, and that's what's debated in the family court. Like how much should they get? Da, da, da. How wealthy is the guy? You know, exactly. I know we're struggling on time. So (laughs) let let me, let me, let me land the plane, which is that I'm, we're both pro-marriage. And we would both like Very much, for yeah. more people to get married. And to stay married. And to stay married. <laughs> and My point married, is yeah. that I think mm-hmm. that that by normalizing prenuptial agreements, mm-hmm. that will aid that aim. Because mm-hmm. no man of a lot, a lot uh, you can take it out of a man or woman, uh, uh, some, someone of means or who's on that trajectory who is hearing, wait, so there's no fault divorce laws. I can do literally nothing wrong. And this person is entitled to premarital assets, during marital assets, and then also a portion of my future income, potentially indefinitely, just because we got married at some point and then but they themselves chose to But there's a lot of other break. reasons to it as so, I was kind of walking through. It's not okay. like, it's not, it's, I think you're making it sound a lot more arbitrary than I think there's a lot of, you know, historicity, like even in British common law and there's a lot mm-hmm. of co- history in but the United States. we don't live in those times. But the divorce rate in, used to be under 1%. But yeah, but we still live in the times of like human nature of man and women and how human family na- systems human, are built and human nature is the problem. How, <laughs> human nature is the exact problem. That's why we need prenuptial agreements. <laughs> Listen, I, I hear you. I think my, my <laughs> last my last word on it is I think more prenups are actually going to lead to less trust and more brokenness in marriages and not necessarily more marriages either because it's again the posture of marriage is something to uh, protect yourself from. And so you've got to do this complicated legal work in advance. That's the red pill conclusion. I'm trying to, I'm trying to. But maybe we need to do a part two. And I think it'd be cool to have a a divorce attorney on too, to talk about, you know, the ins and outs of this, but I appreciate you fleshing it out more. (laughs) I wish we had a little more time. After our conversation. (laughs) And um, where can people find your stuff, Zuby? Sure. I'm on all social media at Zuby Music. Z-U-B-Y music and my podcast Real Talk with Zuby is on all the usual platforms. Awesome. Thanks. Thanks for coming on and safe driving in this rain. No it's doubt. Crazy, Thank you so much. Crazy Thank rain you. out there. <gasps> all right. As Zuby was leaving the studio, we were having continuing this conversation on prenups. There's obviously a lot more that we could talk about, and maybe we'll do a part two. Um, we were joking that we should do a part two and get my husband there, a divorce attorney, Zuby's girlfriend, and just have a whole family affair conversation on it. But um, no, I appreciated getting to get candid with Zuby and him sharing openly about his thoughts on it. And I think the heart of my our, my position, which I shared already in the conversation with Zuby, is that when entering a marriage, I think it's important to go in with that all in heart and spirit. And the idea of designing these careful prenups for every arrangement in order to protect from these unjust laws, I think is already fraught territory. And the biggest question I would have too, is what are these laws that are so unjust in the existing, especially in the American you know, culture in our country that need to be resolved? If they do need to fix, be fixed, let's focus on fixing those instead of encouraging every 
young couple to go about with this arduous process of divvying up the assets before they've even become one. So anyways, um, at the end of the day, lots of good conversation to be had around this. Thanks. You, thank you guys for listening, interested in your thoughts. And if you have someone that you think would be a good um, family law attorney who comes into it with the mentality of marriage is a good thing for society that should be protected and sacrificed for, and that we should design our laws around protecting marriage as best we can. I'd love to have that conversation. So if you have ideas, let me know. As always, don't forget to subscribe to the podcast if you aren't already. If you're on YouTube and you're not subs subscribed yet, please click that subscribe button as well as the notification bell so you never miss an episode of the podcast. And if you're listening to this on podcast apps like Spotify or Apple, don't forget to give us five stars and leave a review. That will help the podcast reach more people. Also, we have our locals community and we're growing. I think we're getting hundreds more every few weeks that are joining that community. It's going to be where we're going to be posting special updates about the show, behind the scene access about the podcast. And we'd love for you to become a paying monthly member so that you can help support the show. Check that out at the link in the bio. Thanks so much, guys. And I'll see you next time.